My name is Charlene Margo, and I am co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture. We are so thrilled to have with us tonight, Corinne Winter, founder and CEO of Mission B. Welcome, Corinne. Thank you so much, Charlene. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to work with you and your incredible team, Bev, and everyone else on the team. Um, I always look forward to these events because I know that you bring the greatest turnouts in Silicon Valley when it comes to parents. So thank you for everything you've done to make tonight possible. And hello, parents. Um, good evening. Welcome. I'm so glad that you signed up. I know that you're all out there really busy taking care of your young um, preteen and adolescents, and I'm really grateful that you've taken the time to join me this evening. It's purely my pleasure. Uh, I also want to thank the Sequoia Healthcare District that also helps fund this initiative. So thank you to everyone at Sequoia. Um, so tonight, our topic is going to be gratitude. Um, growing up, my dad always said gratitude is the attitude. I grew up the oldest of seven children. I don't know if anyone here is the parent of seven children. Um, I was 18 when my youngest brother was born. Um, a, a really beautiful, happy, healthy home I grew up in. Um, but can you imagine the needs of seven children? So my dad drew a painting that he put on the stairs in our home that said gratitude is the attitude. <laughs> and that's been one of my themes throughout my life. And it's also a huge theme in mindful education and social and emotional learning. And the reason that is, is because there's so many mental, emotional, even physical benefits to the practice of gratitude. So I'm really excited about this topic. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen and showing some slides. As you understand, this is a seminar, um, so we won't be doing Q&A till the end. Um, but I am really excited to um, get to teach you. And then at the end, we're going to get to answer all of your questions, which I'm also really excited about. So I'm going to um, spotlight myself here. Here we go. Make myself a little bit bigger so you can see me. How's that look? Good. I think, Corinne, you need to go to full slide view. Oh, yes. I'm about to do that next. Oh, sorry. Thank you. And it's just loading. So here we are. Cultivating mindfulness, how to bring gratitude into your home and uh, positivity. So I think Charlene talked a little bit about our impact. Um, so I was a high school social worker for 10 years. Um, so counseling tons of students around 120 students a year but we had about 1,200 students in our high school. So I was only reaching around 10% of the student body. And I felt that if students were given the skill set to self-regulate, that they could help kind of coach themselves through small crises and challenges. So I started teaching mindfulness in the classroom and that was uh, next month, it'll be 10 years. And so since 10 years, we've reached 28, nation, uh, 28 states, 11 nations. We just um, went into partnership with UNICEF um, and brought our, our program to the um, Ukraine-Poland border. And um, we're gonna be working with them on reaching a lot of Spanish-speaking countries coming up in 2023. Um, but our main focus is Silicon Valley and Long Island. So we, today I was in Menlo Atherton High School training the, the students on how to teach mindfulness to one another, which was awesome. Early in the week I was training Menlo teachers, um, so um, this week alone, we're going to be making impact here in the Bay Area in schools like Tide Academy and Carmont and Sequoia High School. So maybe one of your children goes to that school. Um, we've also worked a lot in Mountain View and Los Altos. So we're in your neighborhood. And I can tell you have a lot of wonderful children here who have um, taken to mindfulness like ducks to water. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about um, neural connectivity and how many, how adolescents and children have so much neural connectivity going on that they are great candidates to learn a mindful practice. Um, so yeah, this is our impact. And so what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is really the practice of being in the present moment on purpose without judgment. So we have around 60,000 thoughts a day and 40,000 of those thoughts are the same as yesterday. <laughs> and a lot of our negative thoughts are about ourselves. Um, and so mindfulness really helps us to be present, to be more neutral or more positive. It helps us focus our attention. 
um, and be more self-aware. So it's not just a seated practice where we wake up in the morning and we sit for two minutes or 20 minutes, or we sit in the evening and do breath work. It's really also our interface with the world. So how are we interacting with the world? How are we treating ourselves and how are we treating others? So how does mindfulness affect our precious brain? <laughs> so in the brain, we have what's called the amygdala. You actually have one here and one here, so you have two. And the amygdala is the alarm center of the brain. So back in the day, if you saw a tiger in the jungle, you would run from the tiger and your heart would race and your hands would start to sweat, right? And there'd be this whole cascade of uh, alarm systems that kind of go off in your body. So when the amygdala is triggered, all of a sudden the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory, is impacted in a negative way, as well as the prefrontal cortex, which sits right here. And the prefrontal cortex, as you may know, is responsible for higher order cognitive, cognitive functioning and information processing and learning. It helps us learn English and science and math. So I don't think there's any tires roaming around uh, Menlo Atherton, and we're on staying tonight, and maybe some of you are too, um, Menlo Park actually. Um, but there are things like deadlines, taxes, um, for our students, testing, peer issues, um, lack of sleep, right? And so these stressors wear and tear on the body, and they also wear and tear on the brain. And so if you look at a brain scan of someone who's experienced a lot of trauma or is experiencing high rates of stress, um, you might see that in the amygdala, um, there's a little less gray matter and neural connectivity going on. And that stress can be harmful um, to the brain. It could be harmful to the prefrontal cortex and also to the hippocampus. So if we are chronically stressed, it's going to inhibit learning and it's going to inhibit executive functioning. So what else happens in our body physiologically when we're stressed? Well, the first thing that happens is we have, I'd like to think of it as two nervous systems, right? So if I turn the light on, it's on. And if I turn it off, it's off. It can't be on and off at the same time, right? The light's either on or it's off. So the nervous system is kind of the same way. We have the sympathetic nervous system. Think of sympathetic S, stressed. And parasympathetic, I can do letters backwards on Zoom, <laughs> peaceful, right? So when we're in a stressed or sympathetic nervous system, um, our heart rate is faster, our digestive activity slows down, and we begin to store fat. Because if we're running from a tiger and we're hiding in a cave, we don't know when we're going to eat again. So we have to store fat. Our glucose goes up. And we start to secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine, right? Which we don't want to be secreting those all day. So we can train our brain to go into parasympathetic when we experience triggers and things that bother us in our lives. So when we move into parasympathetic, um, our heart rate slows down, we stimulate digestive activity, um, our body begins to become more normalized, we stop overproducing glucose. And so it's healthier if we can be in a parasympathetic state the majority of the day. And it's also healthy that we can learn to switch from sympathetic into parasympathetic. So let's say, for example, you're driving on the one on one. You're in the fast lane and someone comes in the middle of the lane and just cuts right in front of you. Maybe they're tailgating, right? That's what they do first. And then they go around and go right in front of you. So all of a sudden, you know, you might have been driving along, listening to some peaceful music, and you're in sympathetic, right? The alarm's going off. So with mindfulness, you take a deep breath, you calm the body down, and you get back into your parasympathetic, you put your jazz back on, and you're good to go on the one-on-one. -on -one. What happens is we oftentimes don't practice getting into parasympathetic. We wait until there's a big trigger, or um, I don't think we're using the word trigger anymore, <laughs> a big thing that comes up, right, um, in our nervous system or in our life. And so we're not trained to calm down the mind. So with mindfulness, we learn to train the mind over little triggers. So something small happens, right? Um, you know, you, you 
trip and stub your toe and you start to take some deep breathing instead of just yelling about stubbing your toe. Little things. And we learn to recondition the mind so that we don't freak out or get super stressed over these small things. So we started teaching mindfulness at a lot of local schools. Um, we've been in the Bay Area since 2014. And this is data's a little old, time flies, you know. But in 2016, there was a student at Stanford that did her senior thesis, her senior, senior honor thesis on mission based program. Um, I didn't have a relationship with her. She cold called our program and said, I want to collect data. I'm doing my thesis on mindfulness. So she came in and she took a very small cohort of 26 students. And I just liked the way in which she collected the data. She did a lot of observations and student feedback. But on her first day, she asked the students, these 26 students, how do you feel? You're allowed to write two, there was two blanks to write down how you feel. Now, obviously not everyone filled in two blanks. Some students just filled in one. But this was the consensus of what was happening in the class. Two felt okay, two felt happy. The rest were in a negative emotional state. Now this is Barron Park Elementary School. This is not great news. This was a group of fourth grade students, right? Not what we would expect. Now we implemented a 12 week mindfulness program. We went in once a week for 40 minutes. And then the classroom teacher also taught these short breathing practices. And so these were the results. Three students said no change, but two of those students were the students that they said they felt okay. So maybe they're just feeling a little blase. But a lot of the other students had massive changes. Now, she had to analyze every single variable. It was a very diligent project she was working on. And she could not identify any variables that would cause such positive changes in the students other than doing the mindfulness daily and the weekly practices. So of course, we were really happy to see this data. We're also at the Stanford Children's Hospital. So I'm trying to use all our local data <laughs> for everyone here. Um, and this is um, at the Ronald McDonald House with children that are suffering from terminal illnesses at this time before COVID. They were also, um, this was just, um, I think, two and a half, three years ago. Um, we've been there since 2017. They were able to bring their sibling with them to class. Um, so as you can see here, the students were more relaxed, more content, less upset, and less tense. And 42% of students felt like it helped a lot, and 96% said it helped. So if we can help students that are suffering in that way, we can help your students too. So here is 500. This was after our first eight-week pilot in 2013, 10 years ago. Um, we had master level social workers and psychologists and school teachers come in and teach these young folks mindfulness. So this is what I like to call my favorite piece of anecdotal data. <laughs> so if you look around, and obviously this is pre-COVID because they're packed like sardines, but these young children are really practicing this work. So if they can do it, we can do it, right? We're a little older than them. And so um, we're gonna try it tonight too. But just keep in mind that a child's brain has twice as much neural connectivity than we do, right? And our brain is sculpted on repeated experiences. So they learn the same thing every week. So we're just gonna get a taste of that tonight. Um, children are more adaptable than we are, but they're also more vulnerable, which means that if you put a child in a new circumstance, let's say you take them from a peaceful community to a more violent community, um, they're going to adapt faster than, than you would or I would, um, but they're also more vulnerable to engage in those type of behaviors. Um, so it's a good thing to be aware of. Um, it's kind of like that quote, you can't teach an old dog new tricks at 48. I like to think of myself as a little bit of an old dog, but <laughs> we can learn new tricks. It's not true. It's not true. Because now we know that neuroplasticity lasts all the way throughout adulthood. So um, what are the benefits for us, right, as adults for practicing uh, mindfulness, right? We all want to know, even when we go into kindergarten classes, if we don't tell them, do the neuroscience piece right away and tell them why we're practicing it, they want to know, why are we practicing this? Um, so for us as adults, it reduces the gene marker for inflammation. Now, I don't know about you, um, but as you get older, you get more inflamed more easily. Um, and so that's a big selling point for me, for myself, um, reducing stress and anxiety, but also increasing empathy. So when we're more empathetic, we are actually more creative. Like think about if you're a lot of uh, startups in Silicon Valley. So if someone's creating a project or an app, 
um, they're thinking about the user experience, right? They're thinking about the empathy, they're using empathy to think about user experience, right? So mindfulness is really good in that sense because it helps us become more empathetic. So I can talk about data all night long, but I don't want to bore you. <laughs> so I think the best way to understand mindfulness truly is to practice it. So what I want to do with you is take you through a mindful experience. We're going to do four breaths. I just want to briefly um, stop the screen share and just move over to this document for a moment. Um, you are going to be, Bev, who's working with Charlene, is going to be emailing out all of these documents tonight. Um, and you're going to be getting this wonderful handout, which talks about the few things that I just covered. So the benefits of mindfulness, um, the brain science that we just covered, um, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, and then we're going to go to page four. So at the end of the night, when you get this handout, we are, and you want to practice these um, mindfulness exercises on your own, you're just going to turn to page four. Okay. So how it's going to work is I'm going to guide you through these four practices one by one, and I'm going to explain the benefits of them. This part of tonight's class should take between six and eight minutes. So uh, we've also trained the Mountain View Police Department, and then they have me come back into the SWAT team and some of the fire department. And a lot of times um, when first responders are driving a vehicle and they're speeding, they're taught to do a breath. Um, so they want a breath that gives them a sense of relaxed alertness, right? So that's what the five and five breath is. It's a great breath for a student to do when they're taking a test. Um, because they're breathing in and breathing out. It's a good breath for you to do when you're driving your car. You don't want to get too sleepy. <laughs> so um, these are breaths that you can practice on your own as a parent. And they're also breaths that you can share with your children. So I invite you now to um, sit back and close your eyes. If you have access to a bed or a place where you can lie down, it might be a little more enjoyable. Um, but we're going to have more opportunities to lie down later. So sitting up is fine. All right, shoulders back and down. Let's just make a couple circles with our shoulders. I'm sure a lot of us have tight shoulders, I could guess. <laughs> so just get, begin to make circles back. Let's inhale and exhale together. Deep breath in, deep breath out, deep breath in, deep breath out. Another deep breath in, deep breath out. Now take your hands. Bring them to the occipital ridge. That's the place where the head and neck meet. And we're going to squeeze on the right side, drop the head back, and squeeze on the left, and drop the head down. We're going to inhale, squeeze to the right, and exhale left. And then just run the fingers along either side of the spine. Give your shoulders a little bit of a squeeze. Give yourself a little bit of a hug. Other side. <laughs> Good. And then inhale the arms up. Look all the way back and exhale your hands down your side. So it's typically advisable before you sit and do mindfulness to just do a little bit of stretching. Because if you don't, what's going to happen is you're going to sit and be like, oh, my neck's tight. Oh, my shoulder hurts. So just creating a little awareness there. All right. So find your seat, which means shoulders back and down, heart lifted. Place your hands on your lap and softly and gently close your eyes. So simply connect with your breath. Take a slow, deep breath in and a slow, deep breath out. Inhale, feel the belly and heart rise. And exhale, feel the heart and belly fall. Breathing in, belly and heart rise. And breathing out, heart and belly fall. So we're going to start with our five and five breaths. So you're going to breathe in one, two, three, four, five, and breathe out one, two, three, four, five. Breathing in for five and breathing out for five. Doing that twice on your own, in for five and out. And continue to breathe one more breath.
And just think of one thing that you're grateful for. Wiggle your fingers and toes and open your eyes. So um, I would, if I could ask you what it is you're grateful for, but <laughs> most of you probably thought of your family or your children. Um, the next is seven, two, and eight. So this is a great one to do before sleep. Um, and it's a wonderful breath to do just to get yourself to relax a little bit deeper. Um, so close your eyes once more. And let me just preface it actually by saying, if you're really struggling with sleeping, instead of doing seven, two, and eight, you're going to do seven, four, and eight. Like insomnia, you just increase the hold to four. All right, write that down. <laughs> All right, here we go. Close your eyes, lean back, shoulders back and down. And softly and gently connect with your breath. Notice where you feel the breath in your body. Notice that when you inhale, the belly and heart rise. And as you exhale, the heart and belly fall. Notice how your breath moves softly and gently without effort. So we're going to inhale for a count of seven. I'll count the first time. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hold. Exhale for eight, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale for seven. Hold for two. Exhale for eight. All right, do that on your own twice. And then close your eyes, continue your breath. And I'm just going to invite you now to think about one or two positive things that happened today that you're grateful for. It could be that you had a warm cup of coffee or tea. Maybe someone made you laugh. Just think of one or two very simple things that you're grateful for today. And we're going to do one um, series of the seven, four, and eight. So let's inhale for seven. Hold for four. And exhale for eight. Our next breath is the ocean breath. So I hope you enjoyed the seven, two, and eight, and the seven, four, and eight. Um, so we're going to lean back again, roll the shoulders back and down, close your eyes once more, and just begin to connect with your breath. Imagine your breath moving rhythmically like the waves of the ocean. As you inhale, imagine the wave of breath moving into your body and filling your belly, lungs, and chest. And exhale, feel the chest, lungs, and belly relax. So notice how your breath moves naturally and gracefully like a wave. It feels as if the belly is filling with air, although we know it's the lungs. The belly, lungs, and chest rise and fill, and then the chest, lungs, and belly lower and release. And just stay with that movement of breath, moving gracefully through you, just like a beautiful wave rising on the inhale and falling on the exhale. And as you breathe in and out, I'd like you, I'd invite you to think about how grateful you are for nature. We have the most beautiful experience of nature in California, although it can be fierce at times. We have the beautiful ocean and the wind, and these days the rain and the wonderful sunlight and the beautiful sequoia and redwood trees. So think how grateful you are about living in a part of the world that is so full and abundant with such a wonderful, wonderful um, component of nature, components of nature, wonderful components of nature. And so as you contemplate this, I want you to envision something in nature that you truly love. Maybe it's a tree, maybe it's an ocean, the ocean. And as you breathe in and out, just imagine 
glancing. We're looking at these wonderful, wonderful pieces of nature. And then go ahead and deepen your breath. Feel your breath moving again like a wave, rising as you inhale and falling as you exhale. And then bring movement into your fingers and toes, wiggling the fingers and toes, which is a great way to open and awaken the body. And then go ahead and open your eyes. All right, good job, everyone. You're almost at breath four, body awareness. This specific breath is utilized to help reduce anxiety. Um, so there was one study where if you bring your hand, your hand to your chest, it helps you, or you touch your belly, it helps you calm down. It's like if someone gives you bad news, someone might gasp and put their hand on their chest. Um, so you're going to take your right hand to your belly, your upper belly, at your solar plexus, that space right between your ribs, below your heart, and take your left hand and just place it just below the collarbone. And close your eyes. And softly and gently just begin to breathe in. And breathe out. Inhale, breathing in. And exhale, breathing out. Feeling the belly rise on the inhale and the heart rise and then the heart fall and the belly fall. Inhale, the belly and heart rise and exhale, the heart and belly fall. Repeating this a couple more times on your own. Inhale, the belly and heart rise and fall. As you continue to feel the breath moving through your body, I am going to simply invite you to consider how grateful you are for your body. It might not be perfect, but that's okay. It's working for you each and every day. Your heart's beating, there's blood moving through your veins. So just practicing gratitude for your beating heart, for your working lungs, and for all your senses. Take another deep breath in and another deep breath out. One more deep breath of gratitude in and out. And then just when you're ready, wiggle your fingers and toes and softly and gently open your eyes. All right, great. So good job, everyone. You just did four mindfulness practices. And these are practices that you can do on your own. Um, I'm also going to send access to videos. Um, and these videos have me guiding you through some of these practices. Um, and so you'll get to watch them another time if you feel like you need a little more of the lesson on that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit uh, about mindfulness as parents and how to combat negative thinking. I don't know if anyone experiences negative thinking. I do sometimes, probably every day, right? We have a little bit of it here and there, <laughs> some days more than others. Um, so how do we combat negative thinking with and stress with the practice of gratitude and mindfulness? So gratitude is a very fascinating topic. And there's so much research coming out today. UC Berkeley's doing lots of work on it. Um, they are actually at an uh, institute called Gratefulness run by a man named Brother David, who has collected a tremendous amount of data around the benefits of gratitude. But it can help increase your immune system. I know there's a lot of flus going around uh, the Bay Area that I've been hearing about, also, of course, COVID. Um, but we all want strong immune systems these days. Um, it can lower our blood pressure. It can increase our levels of positive emotions, more joy, optimism, and happiness. Who doesn't want that? Another interesting thing is people that are practice gratitude are more generous and more compassionate, right? So if anyone's in nonprofit work, we need more generous people out there, right? Um, so even some of the, um, the countries that have the least amount of income um, tend to be the most generous if they are um, culturally, culturally practice gratitude. Um, and it also helps us feel less depressed. Um, it's an anecdote for you know, depression, um, maybe not clinical, but it actually can help with all forms. Um, and it helps with loneliness and isolation. So all forms of depression, loneliness and isolation, gratitude is always there waiting for you to show up and waiting to help. Um, and gratitude is really, it's a neutralizer for worry. So it doesn't just help with depression. It also helps with anxiety. 
um, as a former, uh, I was a, a clinical social worker for a while and um, that I was doing a lot of work in the field of social work and mental health. And I can tell you that I've given tons of gratitude practices to people and I've seen it work miracles. Um, but another interesting thing you wouldn't think of is that gratitude actually helps us be more present. Amazing, right? So I'm a huge fan. Um, so one way that we become, that we can increase our gratitude is step one, which I consider making ourselves a little more self-aware of what is the nature of our thoughts. Like I said in the beginning of my class, we have 60,000 thoughts a day and 40,000 are the same as yesterday. So I want us to just do a little exercise here where we cultivate awareness of our thoughts and we just notice our thoughts. So we're going to do a thought counting exercise. So go grab a pen or a pencil and a little piece of paper. Um, if that is not accessible, you can always grab your phone, but don't check your email. <laughs> um, and what we're going to do is I'm going to time us for one minute. Um, well, let me give you about 15 seconds to grab what you need. I'm going to take a sip of water. All right. Hopefully you have everything you need. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a tally of how many thoughts we have in a minute, how many are positive. Um, a positive is going to be a plus sign, a negative is going to be a minus sign, and a neutral is going to be a zero. Now, there's no grade on this. We're just trying to assess our thoughts. I'm going to count on my fingers. Um, so starting now for one minute, you're going to write down every time you have a negative, a positive, or a neutral thought. Ready, set, go. All right. How did you do? Um, I had five neutral thoughts. They were all about the time, like the timing. <laughs> so not good at timing. Um, I had two negative thoughts, both about um, a pain in my neck and one in my foot. I did too much hot yoga this week. Um, and yeah, and then I had a couple of positives. So mostly neutral, but two negatives, two positives. So you know, if you had lots of negatives, don't beat yourself up. You might just be having one of those days, right? Uh, remember that book from when your children were younger, the very bad, no good, terrible day, something along those lines, right? We have those days. And so sometimes we get locked in that sympathetic state or that negative state, but there's hope. We can reroute our neural pathways, right? And we can create more neutral mindsets and more positive mindsets. So, now I'm going to talk about how do we reframe with gratitude. So some, let me give you an example. I just had this thought like, oh, I'm sore from hot yoga. And I could be like, okay, I'm sore from hot yoga, but I'm grateful that I'm able to afford to go to hot yoga, which is $25 a class in Palo Alto, <laughs> right? I'm grateful that I'm able to stretch and be present in my body. And maybe those kinks and those soreness is just working out, working that out. So gratitude is a reframing practice that we can do all day long. Um, I'm not naturally positive. I'm really not. I'm truly not. But through the practice of mindfulness, and I, I started practicing when I was a teenager, actually, um, and I'm a little older than that now, just 30 years older. Um, but, you know, I started doing it and I wasn't that positive. And so we can reframe those thoughts. And now we're going to do another activity. So keep your pen or pencil and paper close. You ready? Now we're going to think about what is our negative thoughts. So I put some examples here that might be somewhat common, right? My negative thought here is it's raining so much. This weather is terrible, right? I'm, I think I'm going to sunny California. I haven't seen the sun <laughs> except yesterday for five minutes. Um, so even though it's raining, I'm grateful for the rain, which is filling the reservoir and watering the flowers. Now that sounds a little too positive. Sometimes it's like, that's kind of annoying. This is too positive, you know, <laughs> but that's how we begin to reshape the brain to be more positive with this gratitude practice. Next one is, ah, oh, work's so stressful. I can't handle it. I'm grateful for my job, even though it's stressful and do the best I can. So we have so many of these thoughts throughout the day. Um, two more examples is I don't have enough time. Anyone feel like they don't have enough time? You could raise your hand for that. I'm sure a lot of us. So I'm noticing time management is challenging and I'm grateful I can choose to, to make time for myself. I'm not healthy enough. I am grateful for my body and the level of health I have today. So gratitude doesn't mean that we become complacent and we stop working out. Maybe we are unhealthy and we do need to exercise more, but we can just say to ourselves, I'm grateful for who I am today. And today I'm going to do the best I can. Tomorrow I'm going to do the best I can. So it's really just, it's like a lot of mindfulness is really self-soothing. We're like, hey, 
hey, stop beating yourself up, you know, take it easy. Um, I used to, uh, I had a close friend and I would say negative things about myself. She said, don't talk about my friend like that, would you? So we could say to ourselves, don't talk to my friend about that, but you're really talking to yourself. Um, be your own best friend. And I know it sounds corny and typical, but this is this is where the money's at. You know, I say the Long Island, this is where the money's at. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm using my Long Island accent trying to be funny here. Okay. So what I want you to do is take out that pen or pencil and write down a negative thought you have and create a positive and grateful reframe. So you're going to have one timed minute to do this. I wish you luck. I wish you could share uh, maybe at the end if you want to, or you can throw it in the chat and we can share later. Um, so go ahead one minute. I'll be quiet. All right. So start to finish that up. And so hopefully this is a practice that you don't have to write down all the time, although I invite you to do that too, but that you could just do on your own in your head like that. Okay, practice number three, keep your pens handy. Now what we're gonna do is if I'm in groups and you can do this in your family at the kitchen table, um, you know, as a group, like everyone's gonna say what they're grateful for. Um, you know, each person can do 30 seconds around the table. So um, I, I'll do it right now as an example. I'm grateful. Um, that I bought this beautiful shirt. I'm really enjoying it. I'm grateful that I have clean water. I'm grateful that I'm staying at this nice Airbnb. Um, I'm grateful that um, somebody gave me this nice bracelet. I'm grateful. So you, the person would just go on and on like that and you would time them for either 30 seconds or a minute. A minute is better um, because it helps us realize, wow, there's this endless list of things to be grateful for. And so now we have one more minute timed and you're going to write down Everything you could think of as fast as you can, well, mindfully fast, <laughs> um, write down everything you can that you're grateful for. Okay, so ready, set, go. All right, so start to finish up. And so isn't that an interesting experience? You know, one thing might lead to another. So I was thinking about, I'm grateful for my clothes, I'm grateful for this desk. And then I thought, well, I'm grateful for the wood that is this desk. And I'm grateful for the tree that gave its tree life <laughs> for this desk. And I'm grateful for um, the sun and the rain that helped the tree grow. And I'm grateful for the universe and that the world is spinning on an axis that helps and that, you know, and you can go on and on and on. And one thing that gratitude helps us explore when we do that, a practice like that, like what led to the desk is that we realize that we're all interdependent. We're all interconnected. Um, so it's a really, really interesting and fun practice. So it'd be, you know, something you can try with your, your children or your teens when you're in the car <laughs> and you have them track. No, I'm just kidding. Um, great time for talks, right? Family road trips. All right. So these are just some few tips on, on when to practice gratitude. So it's nice to practice gratitude, um, before getting in bed, out of bed, excuse me, in, in the morning. So I like to say before your feet hit the ground, um, also before going to sleep. Um, so my husband and I actually have a practice that we do at night before we go to sleep. And what was one good thing that happened today? And what are the things that we're grateful for? So I usually go, well, this good thing happened. And then I want to keep going because <laughs> once you start, you realize there was way more than one good thing that happened today. Um, so that's a really fun thing to do um, as a family before meals, of course. And then during challenging times, if you're struggling at work with your children, you know, maybe your children are really stressing you out and um, you have to take a few deep breaths and say, I'm really grateful for this child. You know, I'm really grateful for this job. Um, so that's always a good thing. And I love this quote, um, when life gives you uh, lemons, you make lemonade. Um, my aunt had that um, above her kitchen sink when we were kids, and I really love that. Um, and there's a quote that I can't wait to see all the good that's going to come out of this terrible thing, right? So when something challenging happens, you know, even though it might seem bad, we might, we might talk about all the good things that are going to come from this um, because inevitably some of the bad worst things um, do have uh, positive benefits, right? So another thing I like, the story I like is good luck, bad luck. 
And so most of you probably know this story um, from Asia. It, it was China, there was a Chinese pharma, farmer um, who used to till his fields. And one day the farmer's horse escaped from the hills and the farmer's neighbors sympathized with the old man over his bad luck. And then he said, good luck, bad luck, who knows? A week later, the, the horse returns with a herd of horses and the, time, the neighbors congratulate him. Good luck. Uh, that must be good luck. And he says, oh, good luck, bad luck. Who knows? <laughs> and then the farmer's son um, attempts to tame one of the wild horses and falls off the horse and breaks his leg. And everyone's like, oh, bad luck, bad luck. And the farmer says, oh, good luck, bad luck. Who knows? And then a couple of weeks later, the army marches into the village and every able-bodied youth that has to go off to war. And then everyone says, oh, it's such good luck. And he says, oh, good luck, bad luck, who knows, right? And so that is a very mindful uh, perspective, the good luck, bad luck, you know, because it's kind of true, isn't it? Like, we don't know. I mean, you might be late for something and maybe if you weren't late, you would have gotten to an accident, right? I mean. It, it's not magical thinking, it's it's positive thinking, right? We don't know. Um, so maybe it's raining, but maybe that's a good thing, right? And typically in California, it is a very good thing because we need the rain. So that's another thing to tie it in. Now, I like to also think about how can we express our gratitude with others? And this is a slide that I had for, um, originally had designed for teenagers, but I think it's good to just remind ourselves um, that that when we, when we, tell someone thank you, it actually is healthy for us. Um, if actually someone sees us practicing gratitude, it's good for them to watch us experience gratitude. It's actually good for our brain to see someone doing something nice for someone else. And then that to see that person expressing gratitude to that person, that's all actually good for us. So it's not just about having gratitude, it's about witnessing gratitude, witnessing other people expressing gratitude, and then witnessing other people having gratitude. It's all interconnected. Um, so yeah, you could give someone a thank you note. These are the little things we can do. You already know them. It's just a reminder. Um, just to do nice things for folks, make donations, give hugs, and thank the people closest to you. Oh, and thank the people to check out. I would say the people to check out and the people closest to you are probably the ones that need the most thanks, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so now we're going to do a gratitude visualization, and this will close out the lecture portion of the class. Um, and then I'm going to give you some resources. Um, so let's let's get to it. Let's do our little visualization. So close your eyes, connect with your breath, and just relax. Take a soft, gentle, deep breath in, and a soft, gentle, deep breath out. Inhale, feel the belly and heart rise. And exhale, feel the heart and belly fall. Inhale, belly and heart rise. And exhale, heart and belly fall. And simply notice how it feels to be present in your body and invite your breath to deepen. We're just gonna do a quick body scan for two minutes. So we're gonna scan the body from head to toe and let go of tension. So I'm gonna invite you to lean back and relax a little more. If you want, you can lie down for these two minutes. And as you inhale through the nose, notice that the breath is cool. And as you exhale, notice that the breath is warm. Inhaling cool air. And exhaling warm air. Begin to relax the muscles in your face. Feel your jaw soften and your eyes relax. Get another deep breath in, feel the belly and heart rise. And as you exhale, feel your neck and shoulders relax. Feeling a wave of relaxation washing down your arms to your palms and fingertips. And take another deep breath in, feel the belly and heart rise, feel the front of the body rise. 
And then as you exhale, feel a wave of relaxation washing down your spine. Inviting the lower back to release. And breathing deep into the belly again, feel an expansion move through the front of the body. And then as you exhale, feel a wave of relaxation moving down your right leg and then your left. Moving down to the soles of your feet and the tips of your toes. And go ahead and deepen your breath. Inhale, belly and heart rise. Exhale, heart and belly fall. And go ahead and think of some people in your life that you're grateful. Just imagine that you're looking one person at a time. So pick your first person in their eyes. And as you inhale and exhale, just say the word thank you to them. And then take another deep breath in. Envision your second person or just two, three people. Imagine looking in their eyes and saying thank you. You can give them a hug too if you want. <laughs> and then our third person, we're going to inhale. Letting the second person go and then exhale. And then inhale. Now imagine a third person that we're grateful for. And then exhale and just say thank you to them as well. Thanking them for being a gift in your life. All right, great. And then you can go ahead and wiggle your fingers and toes. And when you're ready, you can softly and gently go ahead and open your eyes. And so I'm going to just share my screen again. And so here we have a link to the Mindful um, Parent Teacher Summit. I just want to show you, um, we created this summit during COVID. Um, I'm going to give everyone free access to this. Um, this is something that we recorded and it is typically like $197, but we have all sorts of folks from all different walks of life all different perspectives from John Gray to um, David Trevelyan, who's a trauma expert in mindfulness, Shauna Shapiro, who just wrote a new book, Good Morning, I Love You. She teaches at Esalen. Fred Luskin, who I sub for at Stanford or used to before COVID, when I, before I moved back to New York. Um, Dr. Doty, also from Stanford. So some familiar faces you might see around the Bay Area. Mark Coleman um, works at Spirit Rock up in um, Marin area. And so there's all these incredible speakers, Makana, performing artists that used to work for us. Um, Esther, who you might know from downtown Palo Alto, she um, is an amazing mother. You might know some of her children. So anyway, there's a lot of really cool people here. So you're going to get free access to this Mindful Teacher Summit. And we're doing 36 interviews to all of these experts in the field, which is really cool. And the next thing we're going to do is give you access um, to our mindful videos. Um, so these are Mission Me mindful videos that are on our website. And I'm guiding you through the, these deeper versions of the breath. They're a little bit longer than what I did today. Um, so we have like this example, which is the ocean visualization. So it's the ocean breath mixed with a little bit of- Start to peel petal. This is me, it's a little loud, sorry. Um, let me turn it down a bit. So I'll just play it for 10 seconds. Make sure you're in a comfortable seated position. Bring your attention to your breathing. So as you can see, there's a visual there. The other one's like the rainforest. So imagine we're in a beautiful rainforest and we're connecting Great. with our breath. Um, yeah, so those are some resources. And also, if you know any teachers, we have um, scholarships to our online teacher training. Um, if you know any six through uh, 12th grade teachers that are interested in teacher training was another resource that we have to give out. Um, we are a nonprofit, so a lot of our funding, um, you know, helps us pay for these scholarships for teachers um, that might not otherwise be able to afford it. So with that, I'm just going to share my screen one more time so you have my contact information. I need to leave a lot of time for um, 
Q and A, but there's my contact information and it's also going to be in your handout. And also you're going to get an email from Charlene's team and that's it. So thank you for letting me speak tonight. Remember gratitude is the attitude and I wish you all the best of luck for a very happy 2023. And I really appreciate all the parents that, that showed up tonight and tuned in. And I, I now hand the, back, the mic back to Charlene. Thank you, Charlene, for having me. Thank you, Pakrin, for all that. That was wonderful. It made me remember that the gratitude journal is a really important thing to do. I've done it for years and really life changes if you do it for two weeks, doesn't it? Yes, it's it's great. Gratitude journals are really wonderful. And I know that it's good for kids too. One of my favorite children's books is Fortunately, Unfortunately. Do you know that book? I don't know that, but it sounds perfectly aligned with what we taught tonight. It really is. It's a great way to introduce kids to that idea that you were talking about that good things can happen, right? Good luck, yeah. maybe. Yeah. So, all right. We have time for just a couple of questions, if you don't mind, Corinne. The first one is something that we hear from parents all the time, which is, how do you get a teenager interested in mindfulness? That's fine for you, mom. My daughter says and rolls her eyes, but not for me. <laughs> yeah, it can be tricky. Um, what I would do first is make sure you're, you have your own personal practice and you're practicing. You can do it in the area of the home where they see you practicing. Um, you can share the benefits for you. Like, oh, I was so stressed yesterday and I was so worried about such and such. And then I did my mindfulness practice and I felt so relaxed. Um, so do it in an authentic way, you know, not like a way that you're, they know you're trying to pitch it to them because they know us. Um, you know, maybe when you're driving in the car, put on like a mindful talk or discussion. And if they say, I don't want to listen as well, it's my car, you know, we're listening to what I'm listening to. Um, you could always, um, what else? Oh, wait wait till a time when they're vulnerable and they're stressed and they express to you, I'm really nervous about something or scared about something and say, I know you said you weren't interested in mindfulness, but can I just teach you this? Just, just to give it a try. Let's see how it works, you know, and, and share the science with them. Talk to them about the amygdala and, and maybe have a separate conversation. Maybe don't even call it mindfulness. Just say, you know, I learned this breathing technique that's phenomenal. And they're the Navy SEALs do mindfulness and they're doing it at, you know, corporations in Silicon Valley. So, you know, fine. Maybe there's like um, a group of people that your students look up to, like maybe it's football players, maybe it's tech people, whatever it is, but I'm sure you could find that where, where whoever they idolize or look up to um, that they're probably doing mindfulness. So that's another thing you could do as well, but okay. take, you don't, don't push too hard. <laughs> They'll come around. My friend taught yoga and mindfulness and her sons always made fun of her all throughout high school and then one became, moved to an ashram or, and the other one became a yoga teacher. So they teased her all throughout high school, but she says she was just planting seeds. Look at that. That's awesome. Yeah. You all right. Know. <laughs> um, one of our attendees is asking where we find the links that you showed. Corinne, are most of them in the guide that we're going to send out or are there other links we should include? Yeah, I'm going to send you a follow-up email this evening, right? When we hang up, um, it'll come from me or Julie. We're working together. So you will get that follow-up email within the next 15 minutes once we hang up the phone. And that will have all the links to the free, free resources as well as um, scholarship links. Because like, for example, um, the online parent platform requires a link to get the scholarship. Um, so sometimes people are like, where, where do I put in the code for the scholarship? So if you just go to YouTube and say like punch in scholarship code, um, okay. for Eventbrite, it'll come right up and it's, it's the best way for me to explain it really. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Well, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, including yours, Corinne. So we are out of time for tonight, but I just want to thank you on behalf of everybody. It has been a wonderful session. And do you have some final words for us, Corinne? I just want to say I'm grateful to all of you. Um, I'm grateful to Charlene and Bev and the whole team. Um, and I'm really grateful to all the parents that showed up. I know you probably already spent a lot of time on the computer. So my, my last tip of wisdom is just to the moment you catch yourself in negativity, just switch, switch on the gratitude. And it's a great practice. So good luck with it. All right. Thank you, everybody. And we appreciate all your positivity in the chat and all the comments and all the thank you. So again, big thanks to Corinne and Mission B. And again, you'll be hearing from us parents when we follow up with the Spanish version of this great event. Take care, everybody. Stay dry. Hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.